Good evening. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Indigenous Arts in Transition Seminar and our first evening event of the spring semester. With what might be a record Zoom turnout. At Bard Graduate Center, we study the material world, seeking knowledge about the past and striving for critical understanding of our present and presence here. I ask you to join me in respectfully acknowledging this place as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenny Lenape. We recognize New York City as a home for many indigenous people, and we honor their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. It's a great privilege and a joy to introduce this evening's speakers. It's been a long time coming. And I'm looking forward to a lively conversation following their presentations. Jill Alberg Yo is the Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. In 2008, Alberg Yo received her PhD from the University of New Mexico where her dissertation focused on the social life of weaving in contemporary Navajo life. Along with Kiowa artist and curator Terry Greaves, Alberg Yo is the co-curator of the traveling exhibition, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists. At MIA, Alberg Yo seeks new initiatives to expand understandings and new curatorial practices of historic and contemporary Native art. Heather Atone is Senior Curator at First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. She examines the intersection between Indigenous cultural knowledge and contemporary art. Working in the Native arts community since 1993, she has curated numerous exhibits, publishes regularly, and continues to seek opportunities to broaden discourse on global contemporary indigenous arts. She is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and descended from the Choctaw Nation. She and her team are working to prepare a global destination celebrating the histories and culture of Oklahoma's tribal communities set to open in May 2021. So while we can't meet in person, I want to thank you both for being here in the, Zoom in the Zoomscape and for sharing your work with us tonight. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jill to get us started. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. And um, hold on one second. Can you see that? Everybody see that? Yes. Thank you so much, um, Hadley, um, for that warm introduction. I'd love to thank the Bard Graduate Center for holding space for us over this two years now, I think that we've been trying to have this happen. I want to I want to thank so much Hadley and Aaron for this just um, generous invitation. Um, and Laura Minsky, who has elegantly kind of choreographed all of this. I'd also like to thank my fellow, my friend and fellow panelist, Heather Atone. It's good to see you, Heather. Um, I'd like to recognize that I'm coming today from cold, very cold and snowy Minnesota, which is the homelands of the Dakota people. And so today I'd like to talk about a story in the making, creating hearts of our people, native women artists. And it's the, it's something, um, a discussion I haven't um, discussed in, um, in this kind of setting before. So I hope that there's something that people take away from it. I'm doing this in part to extend the discussion that the Bard Graduate Center had in previous years on a focus on object and objecthood. 
and I thought since that's something of interest to me that um, that I would talk about it in terms of parts of our people. So I'll get down right to it. I've thought deeply about the power of objects over two decades of anthropological and curatorial work. Today, I'd like to discuss this subject in relation to, in relation to a recent large project. Hopefully, my experience may ground which is typically a very dense theoretical discussion towards one more rooted, one more concrete. I personally find that specific examples often lead to productive spaces for exchange, for dialogue, for discussion that may lead to nuanced shifts in curatorial theory and practice. So my focus today is a discussion on the process of the selection of objects for an art exhibition. Today, I argue how we choose, what we include, and what we leave out of exhibitions raises some crucially important questions that we ask ourselves in the field of anthropology and in art curation. So how is it that we choose what is to be included in an art exhibition? Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists was a large traveling exhibition. Its debut was in May 2019 at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which then traveled to three other museums and it showcased the vast artistic accomplishments of Native women across time and place. Terry Greaves, the co-curator of the show and I, knew that in order to tell such a story and to create an exhibition of this great of a scale required a collectivity of women. The art objects that would become the core exhibition contain vast expanses of histories, of knowledge, and practices that no single individual could accurately or authentically discuss. People from native and non-native cultural backgrounds and different disciplines from artists to art historians, creative writers to anthropologists guided our understandings of these extraordinary works of art made by native women from 1000 CE to the present. So we've been told on several occasions, both when we were creating the show and since then, that this was a radically different way of doing things. This inclusive approach challenges long held assumptions of curatorial authority in the field, in art curation, and perhaps academia as well. That an individual might possess the expertise to implement a project of this scope was inconceivable to us. And we had no interest in claiming this authority. In early November, 2015, Mia hosted 21 native artists, curators, scholars, and non-native scholars to help launch the creation of the exhibition. The advisory board convened for three days during which we sought to collectively ask one question, why do Native women create? We developed the major themes of the exhibition through listening, conversing, laughing, exchanging ideas, challenging assumptions, and discussing. And here is our board. You can see Heather was here with us. Um, she was coming in from Oklahoma at the time. She was defending, getting ready to defend her dissertation, but she was there at every moment, every step of the way. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about process here. So it's not glamorous, right? It's the nuts and bolts of things, but it's in the specifics here that I think are crucial and that can maybe add to discussion. The selection of objects for an exhibition is one of the most significant decisions curators make. Each board member was asked to identify 10 objects or artists essential to this exhibition and to provide rationale for their choices. Our board members worked on their individual selection of objects over the course of four months and collectively produced hundreds of suggestions. Several artists and specific pieces were identified by multiple advisors. 
These were the first pieces curated into the exhibition as their importance within the canon and to the board members could not be ignored. Simultaneously, as co-curators, we traveled across the country to more than 20 public and private institutions, view, viewing thousands, thousands of pieces of art and cultural belongings. When we visited collections, we always invited board members who resided in the area to join us, and those were some of the most delightful times. When we re returned, we then shared this information and in every single photo with the entire board for their consideration and review. The board encouraged us to reflect on the choices we made in terms of geography, historical representation, and medium. It was initially pointed out to us that there were some real gaps in representation. So for nearly a month, we perform quantitative analysis of the works of art from each century, medium, and geographic area. After review, we incorporated more work that, that represented Native artists across United, what is now United States and Canada, and attempted to include, when we could, objects of each major historical moment from 1000 CE to the present in a variety of media. And here is a view of the installation, one of the eight to 10 galleries that we had at NIA. So the selection of the only 117 objects for the exhibition was one of the most challenging parts of the process. It really was, it was brutal. Yet this patient and painstaking selection process, I argue, curated as a collective, was one of the most significant decisions made. A shift of thinking and practice occurs when curation happens in a group. And importantly, including full acceptance that the expertise of many far outweigh any single individual's claim to knowledge, authority, or any ideas of connoisseurship and taste. The selection process also speaks to a second point I'd like to make about the power of objects and what we chose to include and not include in this exhibition. Many of the historic and ancient works in the show were never intended for display in an art museum. Many, but not all of our board members felt strongly about selecting objects with this firmly in mind and with an awareness of the connectivity and subjectivity of objects and their lasting connectivity with their makers, their histories and their communities. So I'm gonna use two examples of works from the exhibition to clarify what I really mean here. First was the inclusion of a membrane vessel and sherds from 1000 CE, about 1100 CE. Several board members encouraged us to include a membrane vessel in the exhibition to showcase a canonical work of native art and to correct the historical record. These work, works had previously been associated with male artists, but were actually made by women. However, nearly every membrane bowl was exhumed from burials. Vessels were placed on the heads of individuals for their journey to the spirit world. These vessels are extraordinary in aesthetic and technical terms mesmerizing works that are found in most art museums across the country and collected for their beauty and distinction, but they were never made to be seen. The curators and board members insisted upon having no known burial items in the exhibitions, but yet we wanted membranes pottery. So we were able to include one example of membranes pot for the exhibition, one excavated in a domestic household setting. It, it took an entire year of reaching out to more than 20 archeologists working just in the Southwest, more than 100 email exchanges to find a single 
example of a membrane pot found, found excuse me, in a non-burial setting. So what does this example of the membrane, membrane pot reveal? First, it reveals that the curatorial process and the choices of the collective take time, patience, persistence, effort, and accountability. It also reveals a real problem facing museums. Nearly every other membrane pot in collections, and there are thousands across the country, are from burial sites. And I and many others would argue have no place in gallery spaces or in exhibitions. The second example involves the potential inclusion of a warrior shirt. Many on our board wanted to include a Plains warrior shirt in the exhibition to reframe non-native understandings that another iconic object of native art, largely associated with men, was in fact largely made by women. We knew of a particular shirt in a museum collection. It's arguably one of the most exceptional, powerful works of art we have ever seen. It contained thousands of meticulously stitched porcupine quills in such complex design with an exquisitely supple brain brain tan hide embellished with blue paint and hair locks. However, not knowing the history of the object, we found it important to ask Cheyenne people, as it was attributed as Cheyenne, what they thought about it. After days of council in Oklahoma, the leaders of the community decided that the shirt should not be displayed. The object with unknown provenance had immense power and it was important that we acknowledge this impotency. The members of the Cheyenne Council were able to clearly convey to us the subjectivity within the work, an object that had importantly ongoing agency and relational power. To all of those native and non-native who would see it were it to be included in the exhibition. We collectively decided not to include the shirt and members of the Cheyenne Council offered instead a contemporary pipe bag, one of this one here, one of beauty, meaning, and power, and one of continued use in the community today. This choice of leaving out of the exhibition objects that contained subjectivity and power was a decision that we felt was as important as those works that we would include. So just in closing, I'd like to say that working within a collective alters everything. Themes, selections of objects, stories and knowledge shared by many resulted in a different way of curating and a different kind of exhibition. It allowed, it mandated in fact, more room for discussion, different perspectives, and relinquishing ideas of curatorial authority so embedded in our fields. And this approach is actually what made Hearts of Our People shine, move people, offer meaningful experiences, and an opportunity to perhaps contribute to a shift in the work of art museums. It permitted us to align to protocols and understandings outside of the museum context putting the exhibition into the hands of native women that the exhibition celebrates. It was the power of the collective and its many voices that brought us closer to the subjective power of the objects themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron Glass, Laura Minsky, and Hadley Jensen for inviting me to join you today as a virtual guest of Bard Graduate Center. I'm grateful for their generous and kind hospitality. Laura and Hadley have been fantastic and really patient hosts as my schedule has been quite restrictive lately. You'll understand why in just a few moments.
I, I also want to just extend my appreciation to Jill Albergio sharing the time with me. Jill is a special human being, and I'm honored to share the stage with her today. As you heard in the introduction, my name is Heather Autone. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. I'm also Choctaw by descent from a long line of beautiful and strong women. I was raised, raised by my grandparents in my grandfather's Kiowa community. I have married into the Navajo community. My in-laws are very kind to me and I'm grateful to have such good relatives. I mention these relationships because I believe that relationships are at the center of all the good we can do. My visit here today is an example of what can come from good relationships. I also want to mention that I'm visiting with you today from Norman, Oklahoma, the center of my universe. The city was settled on the ancient territories of the Wichita and Caddo communities and is just across the Canadian River from the contemporary Chickasaw Reservation, where my ancestors have established a robust and vital tribal presence since the Indian removal forced us to migrate from our ancestral territory in Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Alabama. I enjoy living in Oklahoma, and I'm honored to be here now serving our Indigenous community. I know for a fact that there is a rich body of philosophy, science, and a legacy of literature for which our communities continue to serve as stewards on behalf of all of humanity. This vessel made by Jerry Redcorn serves as an example of this knowledge. In the way that the organization is circular of circular and cross hatch lines form both a map of hydrologic and meteorologic knowledge. Almost three years ago in 2018, I was hired to lead the curatorial department for First Americans Museum. This institutional move took me away from the University of Oklahoma and the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. My tenure at the Fred Jones had allowed me to work with what may be the largest collection of contemporary Native American art on the content, and it included works made by Jerry Redcorn. For six and a half years, I'd been curating exhibitions, teaching courses on curatorial practice and Native art history. I had the pleasure of working with 22 interns in that time, many of whom are now valued colleagues in the field. I was doing work that I considered important and meaningful. And it was while I was still employed at the university that I was part of a session at the 2017 Native American Art Studies Association, at which a question was asked that made me shake my head. The conference attendees were gathered in Tulsa for a panel called Curating Now. The title, I believe, was intended to speak to the shifts taking place in the field, addressing priorities guiding the work of many in our field, myself included. I was very proud to speak to the work I was leading at the Fred Jones during the session, a conversation naturally emerged about what strides were being made in curatorial practice that affect the long-term change to which we are all hoping to contribute. Amy Lone Tree, esteemed professor from UC Santa Cruz and author of the seminal publication, Decolonizing Museums, asked a question that has sat with me since. She asked, what has to happen to make sure that good curatorial work like Heather's is not personality-based, but is institutionalized for a longer lasting effect? I don't know if those were her exact words, but that was the spirit of the question. And in all honesty, I was completely taken aback that the question referenced my work. I did not in that moment have the capacity for reflection to see how accurate her statement was going to become. Truth, I was thinking about what the heck Amy meant as soon as she asked the question, how could any decolonizing efforts be dependent on a personality? Certainly I believed good work with the community could survive the presence of any single actor. As the curator of Native American and non-Western art at the Fred Jones, I believed I was making strides to affect change at an institutional level, building trust with the tribes to create exhibitions, cultivating our community's knowledge through ongoing gallery rotations that engaged our cultures. Amy saw what I could not at that point, that my impact was dependent on me being in the museum and holding that space. And when I left my position at the Fred Jones in March of 2018, Within 10 weeks, my fingerprint was erased. Perhaps the only reason it remained at all was that the gallery rotations that I had curated could not be removed as quickly as I left. Amy's question became imprinted on my hands. Had the Fred Jones not been measuring up to the signs that Amy laid out in her text, Decolonizing Museums, on pages four to five, I'll let you read these and consider your own thoughts. I believe that the work at the Fred Jones had been meeting several of these, and I was really proud of the efforts that we were putting forward. 
And you should know that I've been working in museums since 1993 to create voice and space for indigenous people within museums as institutions. It was well before I had words like decolonizing or indigenizing that I have wanted to help our indigenous arts to be valued within museums to address the gap between the art, the people, and the culture. In the time since Amy asked her question, I have assumed leadership for the curatorial department at the First Americans Museum. Since I left the Fred Jones, I've been working with a team of Oklahoma tribal community members preparing the galleries for opening day in September of 2021. And it is through this institution that I may be finding my way to answering the question that Amy asked. What you are looking at is a 173,000 square foot facility with 80,000 square feet of indoor and outdoor exhibition space. Our team's immediate focus and the work over the last three years has been to prepare the two signature galleries in the South Wing, both of which will help speak to our collective tribal history. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Oklahoma's tribal landscape, allow me to introduce you. Oklahoma is currently home to 39 tribal communities from 12 linguistic families that represent cultures from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, including people dispossessed of the lands upon which Bard College rests. For comparison's sake, there are states with more tribes in Oklahoma, but not with more tribal diversity. We have more languages spoken in Oklahoma than all of Europe combined. The story of our tribes is epic. The story of our tribes is the story of the founding of the United States. The story of our tribes is one of survival and endurance and love and pain, and we cannot tell the story without them. As an institution, each relationship with every one of the 39 tribes is critical to our success. FAM is already building relationships with these tribes through ongoing consultations. We are researching topics that our museum needs for exhibition work, of course. We are also exploring what opportunities that our museum can cultivate to serve these tribal communities. Reciprocity is a core tenet amongst Indigenous people, and we are bringing it to the center of our work. It is important to recognize that the 39 tribes located on the geographical site of Oklahoma is comparable to relocating Europe's 44 countries to an island roughly the size of England. But in a manner of thinking, we are creating our own island. Our museum is located on a site that includes 300 acre located near downtown Oklahoma City at the intersection of I-40 and I-35, often referred to as the Crossroads of America. The site is formed from a series of circles. You can see through these through the architecture of the building, and they are extended to the mound, mound promontory. The architects, Johnson Fain in Los Angeles and Hornbeak Blatt in Oklahoma City, the architecture is the product of many listening sessions held with the local community over several years of what the museum should represent and look like. Well, great, we are grateful for the opportunity to hold, build this for our community. You might ask, how we got such a large parcel of land in the downtown area. This site is available to our Indian people now for this museum to tell our stories because it is a former Superfund site recovered from the 160 plus oil wells that formerly scarred the land. The site serves as a metaphor for our tribal community. Despite historical abuses, beauty and healing can be seeded and bloom. We have survived both the earth and our tribal people. It is our survival that has made me want to make museums a place for us in the future. They have not been a place for us in the past. They've been a place for our things, for the display of the Native American, but the Native Americans were not in the museums as guests, visitors, or as staff. And this has been something that I believe can change. The terms often associated with that change is decolonizing. Sometimes we also say indigenizing. I'm gonna take these terms separately in the first to start. When reading through some of the literature that addresses the process of decolonizing museums, I've enjoyed Jolene Ricard's observation that Douglas Cardinal's museum design for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, while not being naturally native, still acts as the first signal that the visitor is about to witness or experience a philosophical shift. I believe the same may be said of our museum. The shift affected in our architecture that incorporates our indigenous sensibilities is now being translated into an institutional body. The building's architecture is inspired by the wings of a bird in flight constructed through a series of repeating circles. It is through the interrelationship of these circles that the idea of movement is facilitated.
The relationship between nature and humans is materialized in the 21st century mound and the hall of the people. Both of the both are 1100 feet at their height and through their orientation mark the solstices and the equinox. Many of the staff believe that as we move towards the opening that the ancestors have been preparing the site for us. When you look at this sunset, it's difficult to argue. The vision for First Americans Museum extends beyond its walls. We are building an institution that prioritizes indigenous thought and philosophy as we speak to the art, history, and culture of the 39 tribes that call the land now known as Oklahoma home. We are building a facility that will house two signature exhibitions that are each powerful testaments to the strength of our cultures and people housed in a building with many luxury amenities. We believe we will draw people from across the globe to share in the prepared experience. Our work is about a bigger vision. We believe that we can give, have a role in educating people to make visible the role of our indigenous communities within the development of the United States. We are creating a space within which indigenous communities can share their knowledge and engage in respectful conversations about our cultural practices. What is the same, what is different and foster respect for all of it. Sometimes we'll do this publicly, sometimes privately. We believe that we will contribute to the economies of all of our tribes by serving as a gateway to foster new economic opportunities. We have no interest in being the gatekeeper though. Not, a, not as for their economies, but we do believe that we can create business relationships that are mutually beneficial. Imagine, for instance, that our full, full service restaurant is in the process of negotiating business relationships with tribally owned farms and ranches to supply the food that we can serve to audiences sharing the incredibly delicious flavors inspired by our cultural recipes. And in our galleries, we can work with tribes to offer unique programming through our educational work. But before I speak to gallery, the galleries, I want to return to Amy's question. The, the way that the question has remained in my head asks, how can an institution be decolonized to create space for an indigenous curatorial approach? As I ask that question, I want to just remind you that I'm certainly not alone in my interests of changing museums to make them spaces where native people can see themselves. There are many doing good work. If you are interested, I encourage you to look, of course, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, where Jill is works. You can also look at the Peabody Essex Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the Portland Art Museum, the Philbrook Art Center, and the Idle Jorg Museum. And of course, the National Museum of the American Indian and the numerous tribally operated museums. From my experiences, I brought to FAM a curatorial methodology that I had been cultivating through a dozen years plus of curating. However, FAM is the first place where we have embraced this as an institutional approach. Using the four R's found in the emerging methodologies of indigenous research, we are working with tenets guided by our indigenous cultures and philosophies. These are critical because they teach us how to be in the world, not just as tribal citizens and cultural people, but as humans and as professionals. Using these four R's, we have decolonized the museum from the top down, developing our institutional plans with an all native staff of over a dozen professionals. While we are all native, please understand that does not mean that we all agree on everything and have the same priorities. That diversity that I told you about in the earlier slides is not just different languages and tribal histories. It is also worldviews and philosophical priorities. We are not a body of homogenized indigenous folks who all work in some illusion of balance and harmony. We have to work really hard through the challenges that emerge when you have matrilineal and patrilineal cultures, when you have people who come from the stars and come from the earth, when you have histories that have not always been polite to one another, to say the least. We each carry our individual and cultural histories into play. So you can only imagine the challenge of drawing a consensus for the emotionally and culturally sensitive tasks that we manage. What we are affecting is an indigenized approach to a colonial project. The museum has been a site of historical trauma for Indian people. We recognize that. In fact, we have been reliving and reactivating the historical trauma for our team members as we have wrestled with the selection of stories. We have had an amazing curatorial team. They have worked every day to create something special. We all feel the burden of our work because it is so personal.
We know we will be judged by our communities, our families, our grandparents. We are telling our own stories and that is not the common pursuit for curators. So we have carried this project very closely to our hearts. Please know the pressure is immense and sometimes suffocating. As I was saying, the challenges have been in our commitment to work with consensus. Selecting the stories for our galleries has not been difficult because we were looking for which story was the strong enough. But in the limited space of a gallery with only a limited number of didactic panels, we have wrestled with the extreme truth and value that so many of the stories deserve to be told. It has been incredibly painful to work our way to the dozen or so that fit. And as the adage says, History is not everything that happened in the past. It is the stories from the past that we remember to tell. So I'd like to discuss some of the work we've done to prepare the Oklahoma Gallery to share how we are materializing our intercultural vision. Our team has carried an immense weight as we've developed the conceptual framework for our gallery. And this responsibility has guided our decision-making process as we recognize that we are creating space for the voices of our ancestors as we build an institution for our future community. In the main gallery, Oklahoma, the Tribal Nations Gallery, we tell the collective story of the 39 tribes of Oklahoma. And we begin this with the beginning through our Origins Gallery. An immersive theatrical experience, we will introduce our visitors to our history and begin a chronological section by sharing tribal origin stories. We've worked with a group of elder community members who guided us to organize these stories by speaking to our shared values respect, reciprocity, relationship, and responsibility. Using brief portions of four tribal narratives, we will share how we know the world to have been created. We will express how important these shared values are to our collective identity as indigenous people. Working with the tribes to secure approved versions of their stories, we are seeking to establish the concept that we have a unique relationship to the earth, the stars, and the sun and the animals that were here when we arrived. At the exit of the origins gallery, we're placing a continental map and with tribal guidance, we have been able to identify every single tribal gardens of Eden, where they are located and thereby translating myth to place and time. And this is how we begin our chronological section. The chronological section is organized through a binary of nationhood in the timeline and peoplehood in the value circles. This binary is further organized into three sections from origins to the present, broken at the moment of the Indian Removal Act and the Oklahoma statehood, both significant moments of land dispossession. The timeline physically serves as a line of connected historical events that represent tribal engagement and acts of nationhood. Opposite to the timeline are three circular, sp circular spaces we call value circles, where we examine the human experience of that same history and how tribes have acted on peoplehood to preserve our communities, our cultures, and our identities. And we are planning an emotional arc to our storytelling process, intentionally pushing visitors to share the historical experiences of indigenous communities, including our moments of pride and power, but also significantly the grief and the trauma of the past. The intergenerationally past historical trauma has been carried too long in our indigenous community. We, like other BIPOC communities, have been carrying these burdens for too long, while the white patriarchy has erased our stories and profited from our invisibility. Our indigenous folks have carried our community's suffering, fighting for our human rights, resisting the assaults of racism and colonialism that continue to thrive in the US. We've carried these stories while being constantly asked, why are we still upset about the historical injustices? FAM gives us an opportunity to express intellectually and emotionally how history informs our collective contemporary experience. It has become clear to me that in order for us as Native people to move forward, we need to be able to have these stories and the emotional burdens picked up by others in our community outside our native folks. And if that burden can be shared, it is my belief that we can all move forward to celebrate our collective survival and create a future that is mutually beneficial. Each of the chronological sections helps to tell the story of how our tribes moved into the landscape of Oklahoma and how we have set new roots on this landscape. 
We've worked with historians to create a timeline seen in the background that documents over 600 events experienced directly by the 39 tribes. This timeline is a significant scholarly undertaking. And while we have constructed a framework, it will be a project that we will continue to build. Can you hold that slide for just a second? The chronological section leads to the Community Voices Theater, where the gallery is shaped like Oklahoma and surrounded by double-heighted walls covered in photography that celebrates the landscape and culture scape of Oklahoma. One of the priorities we have been working with is to engage as many creative natives from Oklahoma's rich human resources. The Community Voices Theater is an analog audio experience counterpoint to the fully immersive theatrical experience of the Origins Gallery. It's been a pleasure to work with so many fantastic community members, led by the good folks at Fire Thief Productions in Tulsa, building a soundscape of Oklahoma to play on a 3D sound system. The second half of the gallery will consider the question, what it is to be an American Indian in Oklahoma today, examining how Indigenous people have been represented through imagery, through sports and games, through warriors, We've built zones that we believe will expose the lies and speak truth to power for our communities. Each of these spaces are filled with life-sized imagery of our tribal community, our leaders, our warriors, our activists, and our protect protectors. And finally, our gallery experience will conclude, I think it's gone backwards. There. And finally, our gallery experience will conclude with prayers and blessings that revisit our core tenets of respect, reciprocity, relationships, and responsibility. We've created an experience that provides to our museum visitors a superficial introduction to the complex art, histories, and cultures of the 39 tribes in Oklahoma. You might think that my use of the term superficial is a criticism of our work. In fact, it is an honest recognition and awareness that no museum exhibition can answer all of the questions. But if we have done our job right, the visitors will have smarter questions. As an institution, we have years of work ahead of us, perhaps centuries of work, to properly share all the stories that we know of now, not to mention the stories that are being made now and will be made in the future. With over 600 images, 25 media projects, and 700 plus didactic labels, if we have done our job right, visitors will leave our institution with some respect for the complexity of our tribal stories. The galleries have benefited from a series of creative charrettes wherein we have asked the great thinkers and spiritual leaders of our tribal community to help us build our frameworks and to guide us as we identify the boundaries we need to respect. We are committed to speaking to our histories and creating a space that prepares for our future. We also have an advisory board of eight scholars and leaders, all of them tribally enrolled um, in Oklahoma tribes with whom we meet regularly to review our progress and check our work. They have encouraged us to be bold, reprimanded us for being too careful and challenged us to make the museum a reality. From this work, I've learned to lead with love, and I am filled with deep gratitude for our ancestors' survival. I've wrestled with the challenge to decolonize a museum and create space for our indigenous community. This work has led me to a few clear concepts for my own work. And this is beca possible because of the good thinking of Amy Lone Tree and so many others. Decolonizing means to embrace the idea that an institution can be serving the community, that our work must have a direct benefit to the people whose arts and stories are embodied in the exhibitions and collections. That indigenizing means claiming space for indigenous philosophies and values to be centered within the decision-making process. That decolonizing and indigenizing are two different processes, but they are also mutually informing. And where these processes merge is in the enaction of our core tenets that using these to guide us moving forward, we can respect all cultures and people represented by objects and museum galleries. One of the key aspects of our museum is that when we have discussed what we will focus on, of course, as an art curator, I want to do art exhibitions. But during these conversations, something that has become clear for me is that indigenous museums have to work against becoming aligned as a particular type of museum. Think about how colonial museums are either art museums or science museums or history museums or natural history museums. They focus on a particular component of culture or knowledge. But for our native people, 
These things are not so easy to parse out. Consider this water jar again. Depending on which type of museum, it might be presented as an ethnographic object from the Caddo with the distinctive red clay etched with repeated lines. It might be shown in an art museum as a ceramic with minimalist geometric designs on a fully rounded form. It might be shown in a history museum as an object that serves as evidence of a historical culture. And finally, it might be shown in a science museum as an object that depicts the hydrologic cycle. In our museum, this type of object can be all of those things simultaneously. We'll be able to create space for the way our objects speak to our ways of thinking about science, our history, philosophies, and cultural values. We are making space for indigenous communities to guide our vision. And we are hoping that this place will be something special for all of our audiences. With that, I invite you to join us when we open in September of 2021. I'll be there. Chuck Mushki, thank you. <laughs> you guys have to unmute yourselves so we can have a conversation. I saw Raphael clicking his fingers. Thank you for the very, the very retro clap. So. Thank you both for these presentations. Um, you've, you've given us new pathways to think with. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, so with our remaining time, I'd like to open it up for questions and conversation. And first we'll begin with those who are on the panelist side here. Um, and then the audience, and just a reminder to use the Q&A function if you're a meeting attendee. Um, Kathleen, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just gonna jump right in there. Um, thank you both for those really wonderful presentations. Um, Jill, I was really interested in hearing more of behind the scenes and the organization of your Mammoth exhibition. I just came from a, a reading group from my museum that was actually focused on the catalog for the exhibition as their, as their select. So that was kind of exciting. Um, I have my question actually is for Heather. Um, another mammoth project. Congratulations. I can't wait to see how it all <laughs> turns out. Um, but the, something you brought up at the beginning of your a presentation I just wanted to dig a little deeper on. And I think this is a question for you, um, but I think it's something maybe people on the panel might also want to say something about, but this problem about these best practices being lost when particular individuals leave their institution. Um, I think that's really a problem. I think that's a big problem. And I think it's um, in part because of who is working in the field. Um, there's not enough of us who are really pushing those uh, best practices and there's a, a tendency for institutions to leave it all to one individual on the staff. Um, and, you know, I would be interested in what people think are the potential solutions to um, fighting that because I think it is very frustrating when people leave um, a museum after they've, they've laid tremendous groundwork and a foundation and built those relationships to see how fragile that is and how quickly it can all slip away. Well, thank you, because that was um, definitely something that I don't, you know, I, I, my brother says that I'm naive and I'm always, um, but I, I think of myself as being, um, you know, happily pragmatic, right? I'm always thinking about the glass half full. Um, and it really was, such good timing for Amy to have asked that question. And she really, she wasn't asking that question of me, if you recall in that panel, she was asking um, of several, you know, she was asking broadly, what do we need to do to make this not a product of a personality? And I think one of the things that I came away from that is that these core tenets of respect, responsibility, relationship, um, they have to be adopted by the institution. And I think one of the things that has been very encouraging to me is that, you know, um, I'm, I'm out talking on a pretty regular basis. And one of the things that I have heard more often than not, quite frankly, is that these methodology, this met curatorial methodology, it really is not just an indigenous values. 
that there is are people, you don't have to be indigenous to embrace this, that this is something that isn't necessarily, you know, aligned with any kind of like uh, religious philosophy. It's a very humanistic approach and valuing those relationships as the core sort of um, uh, fulcrum around which everything then becomes um, um, in motion, right? Like things become in motion because of the relationships and how those relationships start to make things happen. And so um, as I have left the Fred Jones, now it's been just about three years, but it has in the last few years, I've had some opportunities to consider what are the things that can effectively make this um, make have this effect within an institution. And the core of the ideas that have come to me, they are a product, please let, please know many of the people that are in this room right now, the panel um, are parts of conversations that I have participated in. And so you guys are probably gonna hear your words cause I'm borrowing them, but they're not my words. It's just, this is the moment I have a chance to share your words past myself. And, and that is that this kind of, for an institution to really think about like indigenizing or decolonizing themselves, they have to create space within the table, right? So there's a table, every institution comes with a hierarchy and those hierarchies are often long rectangular tables with somebody at the head of it and with all everybody else in some kind of sequence of power descending across that table. And what I would say is that decolonizing a museum is to change the shape of the table from a rectangle to a circle, to create some equitability, also some accountability. Because how many board of directors, how many museum directors, they're relying on a curator or they're relying on an educator to facilitate the relationships on behalf of the universe, university or beha behalf of the institution, but they are not putting themselves, they're not putting their money where their mouth is, and they're taking advantage of these relationships that are being, that are being built. So I believe that those changes have to be affected at a board level, they have to be affected at a director's level, and that in any capacity to build a relationship with the, with, with the tribal community, with the native community, that there has to be a recognition that for in, that there is hierarchy in museums, and that there are hierarchies in the tribal community. And so, for instance, in our, in our work at First Americans Museum, we recognize that our museum director is the one who is, you know, in conversation with our tribal leaders. And as we are building relationships, we are trying to help to, to weave together relationships that are not just through those people, not just through myself or our individual team members, but recognizing that as a body, our body, our corpus of our employees has a collective responsibility and relationship with each of the tribes that we serve so that if anybody from those tribes calls us or asks for something, it doesn't matter who they ask, we make sure that our museum responds to that request and does our best to, to meet the needs that they have. I don't think that a single individual can fully enunciate or meet the needs that have to happen in order to make and build these relationships with the indigenous community. And so those are the main changes that I would see is extending it from the through the hierarchy and building it in a counter with counterpoints. I'm sure other people have smarter things to say though. Let's see. I also think that one of the important things that is kind of along these lines is the necessity to build this out in academia and in curatorial uh, opportunities what you see is a lot of people doing really fantastic things. And as you said, Kathleen, then they may leave and then the institution may not know what to do next. And um, it is critically important for these networks of relationships, as Heather talked about, to extend into academia and into curatorial um, teaching and learning modes. And so that idea of deep apprenticeship deep apprenticeships where you have um, people um, embedded in institutions to see how things really, really work um, and understand kind of the nuts and bolts of how institutions work. And then they can then move into different institutions, but also to develop the, the field of um, native art history. We've seen um, so many of our wonderful, some of the matriarchs in the field, um, uh, retire recently and that's and there are very few people who are teaching native art history and that is a real problem that is a significant problem so the level of knowledge is not 
is not um, escalated, it's not building, it's not growing exponentially. And so those are the two areas too that I think is, is really critical for, for a deeper understanding of how, how these things work in creating exhibitions and creating places like FAM, what it takes um, to do those things. Um, Jamie, I believe you had a question. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to the organizers, but also to Jill and Heather. I love listening to you speak about your work. Um, you make it look really easy working um, in this way and doing what's right and holding yourselves accountable to your communities, um, but to the communities with whom you're working uh, but it's not. Those of us who do the work know that it's not easy. Can you talk about how you've maybe an example of navigating that complexity? And Jill, you were talking about the membranes pottery. Um, I'm sure that wasn't an easy decision to come to. Um, you know, building consensus in these large groups can be a challenge. Um, and, you know, as curators, we're not, I mean, some of us don't think we're the ones to make the final decision, although that's what our field was built on. Um, but, you know, how how do you navigate, um, you know, these really contentious issues that you face in your work? For me, I saw the power of the collective. And I just got to say, it was 21 marvelous, incredible women who all came to the table with a clear understanding of what was needed and everybody's ego was left everybody's ego was left you know outside of that table outside of the 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 circle and that was that was a requirement in in order for something like that of that scale for hurts of our people to happen and so developing those relationships and being able to draw upon the expertise of so many people. Um, I can say that there are many, many challenges, um, true grit, you know, I mean, a lot of this is just grit and determination and, and calling, and Leah McChesney's on this call, you know, she knows, you know, I call 20 Southwest archeologists and we had hundreds of emails, but that's what, that's the right way of doing things. That's not just, that's as, as um, Heather pointed out, that's not, only indigenous ways of doing things, but that's just the right way of doing things. And I think that if we understand curatorially that that's the right way of doing it, it seemed, it seemed common sense to me. It seemed like common sense to find that answer. Um, and those are embedded in indigenous value systems, but they aren't embedded in many curatorial practices. The more we we shift our thinking to see that those are the right ways about doing things. Um, that goes a long way, I feel like. I would just add to that, that I think that the idea of um, rejecting the assumed authority through the body of the institution is key to being able to affect, um, you know, a decolonizing approach. Uh, as, as This is true. And I think Jill's right that there's a matter of this that has to come through the academy, um, teaching people to have work with some humility, to work with communities. Let me tell you, I don't go into a community telling them, I'm going to tell you what I want and tell you what I know about you. And then you can just tell me the yes or no that I need. Like, that's not how I approach it. I mean, I approach it in a very way that is based on humility and respect. And starting from that, you open up a open up the opportunity for a conversation that can be much more profound than you could have imagined. That's what my experience has been, is that going in with the assumption that I don't know crap is much more beneficial than me going in thinking I know, I already know what my answer will be, or to think I'm the smartest person in the room. Um, Katie, why don't you go ahead and um, ask your question. You're muted. Wouldn't be Zoom without somebody making that mistake. Um, thank you so much for your presentations and, and for letting me be here with you today. I want to pick up on what um, Jamie was saying and 
uh, in the fact that you both make this look so easy when it's not. Um, and I want to ask Jill a little bit to say a little bit more about how do you get your museum to not only let you do this, because obviously this, you know, working with 21 people is a giant undertaking, but the amount of time that that takes uh, and the amount of money in terms of traveling to all the places that you went to or deciding that you're going to have the time to spend uh, three days sitting with the Cheyenne to find out about the shirts. How do you um, help to make your museums allow for that, right? We all work on these incredibly compressed timelines that work directly in conflict with the kind of curatorial message that both of you have just outlined. I think that Mia was really fortunate um, to be given all of the resources that we were given. Um, and um, since this had never been done before at Mia, I think that we got a lot done and a lot happened because people may not have known you know, what we were kind of doing and what this exhibition was about. So there's that part. But at what I've said in, in Zoom discussions before, one of the things that, that I like, I, that I share with everybody is that so many funders came to us. The re, the, this was realized through the generous funding that we received. We could not have done it without that. As you know, we could not have done it without the, with incredible funders. And they came with us to Terry and I, and Terry usually led the charge and she was the one who really sold, you know, sealed the deal. But they believed and they gave us um, resources, financial resources for making it happen and for um, giving the museum kind of a little bit of more agility to understand that this time was needed, was necessary in, or, in order to create an exhibition of this scale and that scope. But here's the thing. The thing is, is that all of our donors that gave so generously said, we aren't just doing this primarily because the, about a, a show about Native women artists, we're doing it because of the process. We're doing it because of the curatorial process that you chose. And so I share that with everybody here, that there are so many foundations, there are so many individual people who really believe in this kind of curatorial um, approach that can allow for a little more wiggle room, a little more space, but there is these opportunities because they really believed in our process and they believed in our board and in the power of the collective, the power of the board. And so I think that that's available for everybody um, these that that the foundations are really looking for these kinds of projects, these long longer term projects to fund these projects that require us to um, consult and require us to learn that we don't know, as Heather said, we don't know anything um, and we need to learn all of these these things. So I think that that's something in our favor. Um, Nancy, go ahead. You're on. You're uh, right there. Yes, I've got it. All right. Thank you. I'm Jill Heather. So great to see you. Thank you for your wonderful presentations. Um, I'm jealous. I'm envious because um, when I think of hierarchies, and especially at the Brooklyn Museum, I think of curatorial hierarchies and curatorial collection hierarchies and the challenge of even getting a Native American art exhibition approved. Um, you know, so coming from, so Heather, this question is from you because you had experience from Fred Jones, which is an art museum, you know, and then now you're at FAM, which is sort of this great, you know, like NMAI, you're all working toward the same goal, but breaking through those really rigid, you know, and then it comes from the top you know, at Brooklyn, you know, the director, she privileges contemporary art, um, you know, and how, how as curators, you know, non-native curators, how can we advocate successfully for our projects and get our 
administrations to think differently? Well, I, I actually think this is a, I, I, please forgive me, but I think this is a question for Jill because I think she effectively did exactly that by making the project co-curated with a native person. And I think that this is something where the audience here is not able to hear. <laughs> uh, Terry Greaves is um, a firestorm. And I think that this is an act of, on, uh, coming back to my comment about humility, Jill humbly stepped aside and said, not only am I not the right person to speak on behalf of native people, but I can shepherd this project, right? She stewarded the project on behalf of the museum through the whole process. And please do not think that that undermines or diminishes the hell that she had to go through to make that happen. But I think the other part of it is that she embraced um, that Terry's voice was really the one that needed to help with this. And then shifting the gears over to um, recognizing that, and Jill, I'm, I'm telling your story, tell your story, you do it. No, no, I think that's beautifully put. I think that there, what Heather said is critically important too, and that can offer also a, a really good um, avenue for people working in art museums. I think that Terry, as a non um, art, art historian, as, as, as somebody who was not working for Mia, she was um, able to bring to, to our um, organization something that I could never bring. Um, and many, all of the things that I could never bring. And, and working and co-curating exhibitions with boards or co-curating with uh, an indigenous person outside of academia is a beautiful thing. And it's a refreshing thing and it's a necessary thing and it makes it makes for a so much more um, beautiful, dynamic kind of experience. Um, so exactly what Heather said, um, just t having Terry uh, was critical for, for the success of this. And I think that that can serve as a model of, of co-curating with a non um, curator, a non um, practicing curator. Ter Terry is a, an amazing curator and she's curated all of her life and her mother was a curator. She was born and as you know, Nancy, she was, she was raised to become a curator, but it's, she doesn't do it in the kind of, the kind of technical way that we do it in institutions. So that can lend itself to productive areas and opportunities in, in these kind of calcified art museums um, and can mitigate some of that calcification. Yeah, because I mean, Terry, Terry is fierce. She is like, you know, she's the ideal person, you know, on a project because we she worked with us on TV. So, um, you know, and what I don't want to see happen is having your native person come in and then be the fall person, be, have to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, it has to be done very carefully. And um, I don't know, I it, it's finding that right person who can help, can assist to stand up to, as you said, those, these calcified ways of doing things. I think the advantage of bringing in an indigenous person as part of the curatorial vision is that, and particularly someone that's on the outside of that curatorial practice, is their great capacity to see through the gaslighting that happens within that hierarchy of trying to enforce certain priorities for budget or donors or other people's preferences when you're trying to do something that is bridging communities that are otherwise simply invisible. So it's not the people who have the voice, it's giving room and creating space for those who do not have their voices represented and then allowing them to be able to call that out. I mean, this is part of the great gift that you know, visiting curators or guest curators are able to do in institutions is because they, you know, a guest curator can say things that a seated curator, you know, would get fired for, called out for, reprimanded for. Um, museums need that. And there's a push and a, and a shove that happens inside. It's, you know, we, we think about them as like, you know, these like academies are like ivory towers and that they're just anchored in stone. 
But the truth is all of this is about people and it's all about the relationships. Yeah. Relationships are not built between uh, institutions to tribes. Relationships are built through the people. And you have to have enough of a network and a weaving together of relationships that if one person steps out, someone else is able to step into that role. And the rest of the woven tapestry of those relationships are able to hold that. So I think that's something that I just, you know, it's creating and bringing in the, these voices that are needed. And Nancy, it's like, nobody can do that by themselves. Yeah. You can't be expected to do that. And it's like placing all that authority on your shoulders to make that happen is completely a colonialist project, right? You're the one and you should feel privileged and you're lucky to have a job. So you have to hold that space and that's completely wrong. Yeah, I agree. Um, Aaron, would you like to jump in with a question from the audience? You're on, you're on mute. Thanks. Hey. Thank you, Hadley, and thanks to to Jill and Heather for the, the great papers. Yeah, I've been sort of deputized to monitor the Q and A, but it, it, as it turned out, my, one of my questions for Jill was also is was posed by two other two people in the Q and A. So I'll put those together, and it's basically whether or not you were able to or interested in. Um, uh, uh, making public some of the decision making processes uh, behind your the curatorial practice that you described to us, whether there was any space within the exhibition uh, itself, its interpretation material to talk about the balance of inclusion and exclusion, I think especially exclusion, whether visitors to the exhibit were were informed of what they weren't seeing and why. Um, so that's one question. The other question, which I'll just throw out from the from the uh, Q and A while I'm there, is for both of the speakers, and that is um, whether whether you and your institutions are have have done any work either through these exhibits or outside of them with with the local um, public school system to sort of introduce some of the decolonizing work outside the bounds of the exhibit and the exhibits in the museum, but um, to take to take that process into into the public schools, into academia, to sort of intervene in sort of structural racism, and and to to use the museum space and the exhibition practice as a kind of entry point into those larger sort of public spaces of education with sort of the younger generations in mind. Um, in terms of the first question, um, we did for the membrane pot. We did articulate in the label itself exactly kind of, we didn't say we talked to 20 archeologists and did a hundred emails, but we said that we did a lot of work. And what we found is that every other membrane's goal is, is, is problematic. Um, and we articulated that in the panel. And this, this was the only one that we could find. Um, and so we were um, transparent about that. Um, so we, and as an art museum too, I think we we tend to be um, to, to have less didactics. Where um, so I do think that there would have been great opportunities for us to talk about what was left out. I think that that you know somebody said to me actually, Aaron said, well, what about a show? The show the 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 things that were left out of hoop. What was that? You know, and that could be a show in and of itself. On a variety of re for a variety of reasons of why that was, um, so I think that that is very important. I think that one of the things is is we talk about it in the catalog a lot, whether um, it's in the introduction or in some of the essays. We do talk about in the exhibition catalog some of the things that were um, that we couldn't include, but then we included it in the catalog itself. Um, and then Terry and I discuss some things that like the membrane vessel. Um, uh, and I talk about the warrior shirt in, in, in an essay I write about, um, about the, the exclusion of that and why um, and the potency of that object. So I, I do talk about that in, but typically in art museums, you know, they want us, it's, it's typically in 75 word label that you have to get all of the information 
um, down. The other thing I would say, the public school system, and then uh, I'll say it quickly, because I know Heather has probably uh, a lot to say with this. We have developed, um, during Hearts of Our People, one of the things that we said we'd do, we wouldn't develop any programming that wasn't past Hearts of Our People. So anything that we did in terms of community engagement, we were committed to for the long run. So anything that we started, we had a community engagement board and they helped us. And those were um, people, about 12 women from prominent ambassadors from um, Minnesota, mostly Minneapolis, St. Paul, who helped us create programming, helped us create <clears throat> um, outreach events and things. And those are things that are ongoing. We, we did not want to just like tick a box and say, oh, we created this exhibition and then not hear from us for another five, 10 years or whatever. So everything that we did, we baked it into our operational budget. And that was the product of our learning innovation or education team. The other thing that we did is we developed a native art curricula that was all created by indigenous speak, um, writers, whether it was um, Marlena Miles, Hyde Erdrich, um, Jim Denemy, um, a variety of different writers. And then that's available to all Minnesota. That's available on artsmia.org. Um, and all of the videos, we created a Hearts of Our People website where you can get all of that material for free. And that will be in perpetuity for anybody who wants it, kids, you know, uh, learners of all ages. So, so that was a great part of the curricula that was developed um, uh, from parts of our people. So just to add um, briefly, I will say that our museum, if you see the image behind us, this is our site. We're still a construction, new construction site. So we have not gotten to where we're actually working in the community yet, but that is on our target list. It's something I'm very excited to help support when we have an education director, um, which we don't quite yet. Send me your resume if you're interested. Um, and then the other, um, but in response to the other question, which is how did you, um, and I think Erin, if I'm, I'm gonna restate it and if I'm wrong, please, you know, shake your head and like get my attention. But I think was like how to address the things that were not in the gallery that were part of the process, right? So um, we have made a choice. It, we have, um, I spoke to the um, larger of the galleries, it's 18,000 square feet, the Oklahoma Tribal Nations Gallery. But in our mezzanine, which is only 8,000 square feet, we have our Smithsonian loan. And we've opened that up. It's um, it's a story about the creation and, the, and how, um, um, objects. It's called uh, Winiko, life of an object. And it's Winiko is the Caddo word for all the life that is in the universe and flows through all things. And so um, in this gallery, we're really looking at how these objects are a part of our culture. Like they are as much our culture as we are as humans. And it's important for us to respect that they also have lives. Within that section, within that um, gallery, we have a space where we really look at collecting as a practice. And it's the only square room in the museum. Um, and it really sort of deconstructs the experience of what happens when an object is taken out of its cultural community and placed within an institution. What is that experience? And in, in that space, we have two objects that are my response to your um, question. One is that we have a ghost dance dress now for all the objects in our galleries, both upstairs and downstairs, we've done this through consultation with our communities. Uh, a great effort made to um, do uh, tribal equity, all kinds of things. Like if I wanted to talk about our gallery, we could take a whole day. I mean, it's not gonna fit in this time, but um, we have a Cheyenne Sundance dress. And in that dress, um, there are people in our community who consider that dress having been worn in a, in a Sundance, something that they should not be looking at. But the tribe gave us permission. So what do we do about that as an institution? So what we've actually done is we've actually created an interior, there's a, you know, it's going in this beautiful case, and we've created a, um, an interior um, viewing um, blind so that you actually have to come close to the glass and look through cutaway uh, zones so that if you want to, you can look at it. The, tri the tribe's given you permission to look at it. But for those people who might not want to, you can actually take the opportunity and you're not forced to look at it. Um, uh, inversely, we wanted to bring a Shawnee football 
It's one of their games that was given to them by the creator, and it's a very um, critical part of their ceremonies. Um, and we, but we brought it because we know of it also as a social game. Well, when we explored the idea of this football, bringing this football that NMAI has, the Shawnee community, and we have three tribes in, in um, Oklahoma that are Shawnee, um, the Shawnee community did not want this football put on display because it had been used in a ceremony and they did not feel like it was appropriate for that to be put on display. So what we've done is we're paying the money to build a mount, we've built labels, but the ball is not coming. And so it's gonna be its absence in the case to which we have a label that says, the institution is respecting the tribe's decision that this football, like many things in museum collections, is actually not appropriate for public consumption. But we wanted you to know that we've made that choice to respect the tribe's choice by building this thing that you're wondering, why, why is there not something there? So I, that's one of the things. We also have, I mentioned the many stories that we have. We, um, we've received funding um, to support our um, uh, catalogs. And the um, catalogs, I have invited all of our curatorial team to actually submit a brief essay. What's the story that you, that didn't make it in that you feel like you want everybody to know? And that's a chance for us to get those stories in the catalog in a way that we can't put it in the exhibition. Um, the team members are really excited to do this. Um, it's not an easy process. They're already, you know, texting me going, I can't decide between these two. You know, it doesn't matter because there's always going to be something excluded. And I think that's the thing a lot of people don't realize that, but the, um, the, uh, essay, the catalogs will be another way for us to embrace those things that didn't make it in. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we're getting close to 7.30, so I think we'll take one final question, and I'd like to call on Leah. Thank you, Hadley. Thank you, um, Jill, Heather. Um, wonderful to see you and to hear these wonderful presentations, and also to see Aaron uh, for organizing this and many other people on the, on the panel. Um, I have a, a couple of questions here. I'll try to be brief. And in part, I think they've been answered as this discussion has gone on. Uh, but um, so I have a question about how we go about this um, kind of wider change. We might call it institutional change. Um, you know, um, Heather, I think is, you know, you're very fortunate to be at a um, native institution starting from the ground up really able to implement um, the, these changes and approaches um, for those of us who are at you know museums that are sort of historically established and uh, well into a colonial mode how we how we implement these um, more wide ranging and you know changes in a, a, a profound transformation and reorientation so i was going to pose this question to jill um, um, in part i think um you answered that question jill because the question was how how you have experienced that kind of transportation at mia through this exhibit and kind of implemented larger changes that what you just commented on, I think is, is important to think about, which is the educational programming and your work with a, um, you know, your community engagement board. I remember being very impressed by that at the opening um, and, and looking at the ways in which, you know, not only the, the decolonizing efforts through the exhibition, but how to make those endure back to the question that Heather originally raised with her experience at the Red Jones Museum. So I am just wanted to sort of think about the different ways that we might, might do that, that, um, you know, what are the kinds of um, programming that we can develop and what are the ways in which we can communicate, um, share the knowledge that's being developed 
through these um, these uh, dedicated efforts and how how do we go about you know of course I I teach so I'm sort of thinking academically about sort of do we want to codify knowledge in some way this kind of knowledge um, do do we have a new language for these uh, uh, practices um, do we uh, um, I mean, I think about it in terms of the courses I teach on collaboration. Um, I just kind of throw that out there about ways that that we can um, think about or to what degree we want to formalize this knowledge um, and these practices, um, these efforts of decolonization, um, or whether or not that violates the and sort of the very principles that we want to encourage um, uh, in these relationships and uh, the um, the four components that you itemized Heather and discussed and just speaking for the Maxwell we've gone through um, um, we've gone to through strategic planning and adopted a new vision that incorporates what we call the three R's. That is a way, that is a way of articulating our own approach to decolonization. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on those questions, thanks. I think Heather can be much more eloquent about this, but I'm just gonna talk about like little things that I think I've been thinking about recently. Um, that I think can be helpful. Um, I've been thinking about writing labels. I think so much, and I think Heather really articulates this, the difference between decolonization and in, in, indigenization. And I think one of the efforts in art institutions and in places like the Maxwell, places like Mia, that it is imperative for us to call attention to the history of our collection and our policies and our ongoing relationships with um, a whole range of people. And so that can take something just as small as perhaps like in, I'm, I'm gonna reinstall a gallery and I'm gonna put a label um, you know, usually there's like label speak where, you know, this work was created by this person in the 18th century for blah, 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 blah. But I'm gonna say in this case, because I think that the onus is for decolonization, it's very important for white bodies to take ownership, um, both in terms of the institution and personally to take ownership of what how they've been trained. And so one of the things that I'm gonna do in um, this one, gallery is I'm going to say, as, an anthrop as a cultural anthropologist, I was trained to talk about object in this manner, about, about it in terms of you know, its history, in terms about its use in the community, and to really bring to surface that which we take in museums as like institutional knowledge or authority um, and at the same time, at the same, at that same label, we're going to have another label be created by an indigenous person from that community and talk about it from their vantage point. Um, so even just those little things, um, I think, can move move the dial a little bit. But I think that before I, I think Heather will, like I said, speak so eloquently about, it. I think that the, it, there, it is really, really imperative for all of this, a lot of this work to not rest on, and this is in after, you know, we hear it more and more after George Floyd, especially in Minneapolis, you know, the work that needs to be done is the work of white people. That's the work, a lot of that work needs to be done. And we have not yet really done much of that work at all. Um, and so we really need to do that work and be transparent about that work and transparent about that, the ways in which we've been educated and we have normalized these ideas uh, that which have harmed native community members when upon arriving at art museums like Mia and what are ways in which we can bring to surface 
different stories, both our own stories and those that truth telling, but then indigenous story telling as well. Well, in no way do I want to follow up with white people assuming responsibility for what needs to be done. So I don't know if I want to add anything to that, because I think that's true. Um, I'd like to take a different part of your question, Leah, if that's okay, okay, and I'll be very brief on it because I want to respect everyone's time. And that is the question about codifying this process and this information and this way of approaching things. I think that there's some value in that, but I hesitate to think that the idea of codifying it is that then it becomes something recorded in such a way that people, other people can then become, and the risk is that they would take that and then become the authority on the process without recognizing that they need to remain humble in that process of taking that, taking on this, this, these lessons and this way of thinking. So I don't know about that. And I think there's a lot of information that is really quite frankly, the Native American art history as a field really is so superficially done right now. You know, I mean, it's not really been a long time, right? That people have really been studying our, our, our art and how it relates and reflects our culture and our philosophies. And I believe that that's something that we can see. There's a lot of potential because I can see what's happened with European art. Right? People have really looked at what are the political implications? What are the philosophical implications? What are the economic implications of why these types of materials or um, you know, um, innovations took place? But I think the other side of that is that as, as an indigenous person, I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with letting people come from the outside and tramp all over our philosophies when there's not a lot there for them to work with initially. So what I really think is that in the same way that native, that white people need to take some responsibility for the changes that need to happen within the institutions, I really feel like that what needs to happen within the academy is that we really need to foster a strong indigenous presence so that our native community can be coming into this and figuring out how to navigate this because the academy has also not always been very respectful of our knowledge and philosophies. And so I think it's gonna take indigenous people bringing that to the forefront in a very gentle and respectful manner and making mistakes, right? Along the way, cause that's natural, but allowing that in that process, we can figure out what are the parameters within which we can create textbooks that we can create a way of sharing our indigenous knowledge and create some boundaries that protect because there is knowledge that does not belong outside of our communities and what we haven't really reason we've kind of left things the way they are is partially because we are not always sure where those boundaries need to be and so finding our way with that i hope that that's leah i hope that that makes sense to you and i hope that that seems like a responsible answer Laura had her hand up too. I don't know. Where'd she go? I was thinking that um, it, in some ways it, it fundamentally comes down to ethics, um, doing research, doing projects, anything that we're doing, we have to consider the consequences of it and who we might be harming, who we might be helping and change those dynamics. And it has to become in culturally embedded, I think, in academia, as well as in museums, um, and change it from an exploitative relationship to a true relationship, where there are equal consequences for everyone involved. Um, and it's the, the harm isn't just on the Native artists and cultures and and such, um, been working uh, to build that kind of normalizing that those ethical considerations when we're working with our students at Institute of American Indian Arts with our art history courses. And the reality is, is that our undergraduates are always having to do original research um, because the the there isn't that body of research out there 
for them to use as a model that doesn't do harm. So it's a constant um, helping people grow in their ability to see the power relationships and make sure they're not replicating poor relationships. Would Heather or Jill like to respond to that or should we um, try to wrap up here? Well, okay, please join me in thanking um, Heather and Jill.